Hello, everyone. This is Hadi Lisha, interventional cardiovascular specialist. I have the honor of having Dr. Haider Hashim today from Washington Medical Center. Uh, he is an expert in coronary microvascular dysfunction, and uh, I'd like to chat with him about this hot topic and uh, all the new things that are happening. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Hashim. Hi, Dr. Lisha. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Kind of pick your brain this afternoon and uh, tell the interventional cardiologists who don't have any experience with microvascular testing why this is important and how is the invasive testing done? Sure. So, um, so just to uh, give everyone a background, uh, microvascular dysfunction is a disease we all know about, we heard about. Um, we kind of used it as a, um, a diagnosis of exclusion. And we try our best to treat our patients who are coming back multiple times with, with chest discomfort. They visit the emergency room. We get called um, on them all the time. Um, we admit them to observation. They get ruled out. Many of them will undergo um, multiple non-invasive testing. We go from PET-CT stress to SPECT stress to treadmill echo. And many of them also undergo invasive coronary angiography. And um, for years, we've been very good in ruling out. And by that, I mean, we all probably seen this in, in our practices. Um, you're done with a case, someone with typical chest pain, typical symptoms, an abnormal non-invasive um, um, testing that led the patient to the cat table. And we're done and we say, no blockages, everything is good. Um, and the patients will look up to us and say, so what's wrong with me or what's happening? Um, and we always assume that they have microvascular, vasospastic angina, but we didn't have a, a widespread um, disseminated testing, invasive testing in our arena to kind of nail down the diagnosis and make it available for patients. Um, now, obviously, there are ways to do non-invasive. Um, that would include PET-CT scan. That is very uh, specific and accurate in providing coronary flow reserve, CFR. Um, PET-CT is, is, is able to give you the global CFR of the coronary circulation and also can give you each artery separately um, in, in territorial manners. Um, now, obviously, CFR uh, could be abnormal in many conditions that are unrelated to microvascular dysfunction. Uh, per se. Um, with invasive technology, with, with the recent uh, release of, um, of uh, pressure wire X, um, which allow us to do coronary flow reserve um, uh, measurements and coronary flow measurements using thermal dilution, um, I think we're more now more um, uh, able and, um, and um, um, I, I would say we're doing better job in understanding the disease, diagnosing it, and hopefully that will aid us in, in treatment. Uh, simply invasively, um, I don't want to take most most of the time talking about the the technique, but it's it's uh, it's it's pressure wire X. It's the Abbott wire that's wireless Bluetooth connection, um, and all you need to do is um, uh, as if you're doing any physiology assessment of any vessel. Uh, obviously, most of those patients will have non-obstructive coronary disease that's defined by less than fifty percent stenosis in any epicardial disease. We pick the left anterior descending artery um, as a as a representative of the circulation, given that it's the sole um, supplier of the left ventricular mass. Um, we pick the LED and we you you introduce your wire all the way down as if you're doing any physiology. First, you'll be provided with the resting full cycle ratio RFR, which is an unhyperemic index to rule out any epicardial disease. Um, and once you're done with that, you uh, do your thermal dilution assessment using room temperature saline injections, very similar to the right heart catheterization, which we've done. We, we know um, we um, digest, breathe, and uh, every single time we do it. Um, now, instead of giving 10 cc's of normal saline, we're giving three cc's of normal saline. Um, and obviously, you will have multiple injections. You pick the most homogeneous uh, combination of three readings, and that will be your resting coronary flow. Um, obviously, we're using time um, as a surrogate to uh, flow, just similar to what we do with right heart catheterization. It's the time it takes for the temperature change between the guide catheter and the, and the thermostat or the, um, the uh, sensor, the temperature sensor on the pressure wire. And that time will translate into um, uh, coronary flow. And then you induce hyperemia, just like you're doing FFR. It's preferably done with IV adenosine um, and a dose of 140 microgram per kg per minute, very similar dose to what we do with FFR. And then once you achieve hyperemia, you repeat your coronary flow. Now you have coronary flow at hyperemia, coronary flow at rest. Uh, the ratio of those will give you the coronary flow reserve. 
In other words, it's the capacity of your circulation to augment um, in response to exercise or hyperemia. Once that's done, you can also click on FFR and that will give you a free assessment of FFR because you already have hyperemia. It's a very simple procedure. Um, Dr. Alicia, as you're very aware, we will have data released from the Flow Lab study, which is similar to Light Lab study, which we've done with OCT. Flow Lab study is a, is a trial that we did for 200 plus patients, where we will um, tell you how much it takes, um, which injections you should uh, keep, which injections should you um, take out. So we'll almost standardize the um, the uh, technical aspect. I hope I explained it in a, in a quick, few minutes on how it's done. No, that's a perfect summary. Thank you for that. This is uh, very nice. You know, one of the questions we get all the time, okay, doctor, we know the patient has some degree of coronary microvascular dysfunction based on our clinical judgment. How is that going to change my management, doctor? Why am I wasting time doing all this test, getting this patient as an outpatient? Um, why do you think that is going to change the patient's life? Perfect. So we are concentrating today on microvascular CMD assessment, which is using hyperemia and adenosine. I just want to remind everyone out there that the, the comprehensive coronary function testing should include provocative testing with acetylcholine to rule out vasospastic angina, whether it's epicardial or microvascular. The bigger picture is very important to first diagnose and understand. If we're looking at the microvascular only, I could refer to I, I could refer to a trial and send everyone to read this trial. It's called the Cormica trial. It's an elegantly done trial. The sample size is small. However, it, it tested a very important um, aspect of medicine and treatment. It's literally took a 300 patients, um, um, put a 156 and 157 in, in, in both arms, and all it did it says everyone comes to the lab with an indication for coronary angiogram, um, should undergo coronary angiogram. And then all patients underwent microvascular assessment using pressure wire X and the measurement of CFR, IMR, FFR, and RFR was performed. First group was told with the diagnosis and their treating cardiologists were informed of the diagnosis and what you found. And then the other group was told no blockages, everything is good, go home, maybe you have microvascular. I did not tell you what the microvascular assessment revealed. We followed those patients six months and 12 months. And what we found that the perception of chest pain is better in the informed group, that the adherence to medications and satisfaction with medication is better, and a quality of life is better, which means that the diagnosis is a very instrumental finding or, or or tool to help and aid in the treatment. And I use always an analogy that's probably harsh, but it's true to a certain level. If someone comes with a lung mass and you said, you know what, based on your clinical history, you smoked, you have squamous cell carcinoma or you have adenocarcinoma. So let's do this. I'm gonna give you this chemotherapy. None of your patients will stay with you. They will say, what's wrong with this person prescribing chemicals, prescribing medications, based on an assumption. So a diagnosis is very important. And believe me, I've we've done here at the Washington Hospital Center, we, we're collecting where we have our own registry that's now national and internationally available for anyone to participate in. Um, we collected a lot of data and those patients will have prospective follow-up. Many of those patients stop going to emergency rooms. They are adhering to medications. They know what they have. Patients leave the table saying, you know what? Now I know. Thank you for giving me the answer. They might still experience chest pain, but their perception to chest pain proven by a blinded clinical trial was proven in the Cormica trial. That's why it's important. Excellent. So uh, based on uh, this assessment, uh, we know there are mostly four endotypes of uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction, which will differentiate what kind of treatment uh, you're going to be giving the patient. Could you walk the audience through just very quickly, the type of a microvascular dysfunction, it's not all one basket, and how does that actually affect your therapeutic approach? Sure, so I'm, I'm gonna to try to give a more global, just to kind of get, get everyone thinking. Um, in, a, in a typical phenotype, structural phenotype, where there's a problem with the microcirculation, you need to have low CFR, low IMR, and I'm sorry, low CFR, high IMR, 
in absence of any epicardial disease. And low CFR... Tell, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you explain what IMR is to the audience, please? Exactly. So CFR is a coronary flow reserve. Um, and the value we picked based on, um, I would say, consensus, it should range between 2 and 2.5. Anything below 2.5, for the sake of the uh, of this um, uh, conversation, anything below 2.5 is an abnormal CFR. That means the circulation is incapable of augmenting by at least double or double and a half. Now, IMR is at the index of microvascular resistance, which is a way for us to understand this, the resistance in the microcirculation. Any value of 25 and above is abnormal. You shouldn't have that much resistance in the microcirculation. This was validated in trials. This was validated compared in post-MI patients where the IMR value usually higher because we know in an acute STEMI or NSTEMI, some of the um, embolic events could clog the microcirculation. So you expect it to have high IMR. Now, in, a, in, a, in the most typical form, you need to have low CFR, high IMR, so which means you cannot augment because of high resistance. Um, and in absence of epicardial disease, that's a phenotype, structural phenotype. Certain diseases where you where when I mentioned you can have vasospastic microvascular disease where the arterioles, things that you don't see, but they're still part of the endothelin dependent circulation that is influenced by acetylcholine, you could have spasm there because of an endothelin dysfunction. The treatment there is different. And I would just remind everyone, in all these years when we did FFR, we used adenosine because the microcirculation is dependent, is non-endothelin dependent, and it's responsive to adenosine as a vasodilator. So when I want to render the microcirculation paralyzed, I use adenosine. But when I want to have a stent edge that's looked a bit angiographically funky, I will give nitroglycerin because the epicardium is responsive to nitric oxide, to nitroglycerin-based uh, chemicals. So the same token here, the arterioles, which you still can't see, the pre-arterioles you cannot see, they are responsive to nitroglycerin. So there is functional uh, microvascular disease, there is structural microvascular disease, and there is epicardial um, uh, vasospastic disease. Each one of them has different treatment. You might ask me then, what do you recommend treatment-wise? It's hard to... Um, we have some data from the Cormica. The WARRIOR trial is enrolling patients into high-intensity statin, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs um, as a mainstay for treatment because we do believe angiotensin receptor blockade or angiotensin um, converting enzyme um, uh, inhibitors could also aid in the vasodilatation and help. That's why we need everyone, all, um, all hands on deck, because we want to discover this disease. We want to follow it. We want to have a way to understand it. And hopefully we all together as a community build a treatment options and prognostic value for these um, parameters that we just talked about. That's amazing. And we're honestly seeing in clinical practice how uh, transforming this is to patients' lives. And um, you, you, you really make a huge difference. Uh, now, uh, uh, tell us about the new coding um, that you have worked so hard on and what's new in the coronary microvascular dysfunction uh, clinical world. Perfect. So, so um, um, first, I don't want to take a, a full personal credit for this. Um, I get a tremendous help from the Abbott research team um, and the economics team. Um, it's, we wanted to have a designation for this, for this condition. For many years, we assume and um, if, if someone is on your table and you did a cardiac catheterization and I see the code 10 uh, or nine uh, historically, um, you can just check that patient has angina. You didn't tell me why he had angina or why she had angina. We just say, you know what, angina. So it's hard to track those patients. Um, now, after probably a good year and a half working with the CDC, presenting multiple um, data, trial, statistics about the prevalence of the disease, how, how um, enormously it's affecting um, mostly women. Um, those patients always get disregard. 
uh, they get discarded. They, they, the, the disease is a source of frustration to patients and physicians combined. Um, and thankfully, um, an effective October 1st, in two months from now, October 1st, we will have um, a, 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 the CDC recognized microvascular disease as a disease entity, which um, and it, it was given four codes. Um, I can share it with you on a different time. Um, it's it's going to have an acute presentation for patients with MINOCA, patients with myocardial infarction with no obstructive coronary artery disease. And also there will be a chronic designation for the patients you see in the clinic where they have either angina with no obstructive coronary artery disease or they have ischemia. There is evidence of ischemia with no obstructive coronary artery disease. From now on, if those patients lie, end up on your table, you give the diagnosis using CFR, IMR, and vasoreactivity, you will be able to check that box that they are recognized with an ICD code. To get you into the whole spectrum, syndrome X, chest pain syndrome X is recognized in ICD and microvascular was never uh, uh, recognized. A disease that we didn't even know how to explain was given a code. Now we actually have phenotypes. We have variation. We have ways to recognize um, Hashim has this disease and um, um, Licha doesn't have the disease. So now we do have ICD code that will help us tremendously tracking patients, understand their lifelong, the road to CMD, how many tests they went, cost effectiveness, I think will all be uh, helpful. Um, now we have the de designation of ICD-10. Again, not a personal credit, I worked on it, but I got a tremendous help from everyone in the field that pushed through. Um, and, and most certainly the microvascular network that we're both part of um, helped a lot with guidance, the leadership. I'm still learning in this field from experts who's done this before me um, and it's growing, but ICD-10 is, is definitely a step in the right direction. Well, that's very inspiring. And uh, thank you for summarizing the field in such little time. I know how hard that is, but um, obviously for more details, please, um, you know, if you want to provide with, you know, the audience with uh, any sort of um, resources they can get to, to get the practical aspect of invasive testing and um, how to get into the microvascular network. Sure. So you can, again, I, I, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. Um, it's probably the easiest way to find people now. Um, it's now called X. I'm sorry, I said Twitter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can find this on X app. Um, uh, either me or Dr. Licha, we, we're easy trackable. You can direct message me. I can direct you to the work that um, the Microvascular Network has been doing with the newsletter, the quarterly news newsletter that we release um, that will tell you on a Google map who has the capacity to diagnose this disease, who are the experts in the field, who has the non-invasive and the invasive uh, capacity on um, to, 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 to uh, find this diagnosis. Um, um, you can... Probably we can post our email. Um, I'm more, more than happy to answer emails from patients, from colleagues. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm growing in this field. I have passion to it. Um, and I think we're helping a lot of patients by understanding why they're on the cath table getting a cath. 